Chapter 1. The War for the Union, Contest Begun The 11th of April, 1861, revealed the real intention of the Southern people in their dastardly assault upon Fort Sumter. The thunder of rebel cannon shook the air not only around Charleston, but sent its thrilling vibrations to the remotest sections of the country, and was the precursor of a storm whose wrath no one anticipated. This shock of arms was like a fire alarm in our great cities, and the North arose in its might with a grand unanimity which the South did not expect. The spirit and principle of rebellion were so uncaused and unprovoked that scarcely could anyone be found at home or abroad to justify them. President Lincoln thereupon issued a call for 75,000 men to uphold and vindicate the authority of the government, and to prove, if possible, that secession was not only a heresy in doctrine, but an impracticability in the American Republic. The response to this call was much more general than the most sanguine had any reason to look for. The enthusiasm of the people was quite unbounded. Individuals encouraged individuals. Families aroused families. Communities vied with communities. And states strove with states. Who could be the first and do the most was the noble contention which everywhere prevailed. All political party lines seemed to be obliterated. Under this renovating and inspiring spirit, the work of raising the nucleus of the grandest army that ever swept a continent went bravely on. Regiments were rapidly organized and as rapidly as possible sent forward to the seat of government. And so vast was the number that presented themselves for their country's defense that the original call was soon more than filled, and the authorities found themselves unable to accept many organizations which were eager to press into the fray. Meanwhile, the great leaders of the rebellion were marshalling the hordes of treason and assembling them on the plains of Manassas with the undoubted intention of moving upon the national capital. This point determined the principal theater of the opening contest, and around it on every side, and particularly southward, was to be the Akeldama of America, the dreadful Field of Blood. The first great impulse of the authorities was in the direction of self-defense, and what could be more natural and proper, and Washington was fortified and garrisoned. This done, it was believed that the accumulating forces of the Union, which had become thoroughly equipped and somewhat disciplined, ought to advance into the revolted territory scatter the defiant hosts of the enemy, and put a speedy end to the slaveholders' rebellion. But the hesitation and indecision which prevailed in our military circles were becoming oppressive and unendurable, and hence the cry of, On to Richmond, was heard from the border states to the St. Lawrence, precipitating the first general engagement of the war. Our defeat at Bull Run was a totally unexpected disaster, which, for a time, it was feared, would chill the enthusiasm and greatly weaken the energy of the North. But though the South was much strengthened and emboldened by their victory, our defeat had its own curative elements. It taught us that the enemy was determined and powerful, and that to overcome him the ranks of the Union Army must be filled with something besides three months' men, or men on any very limited term of enlistment. Other lessons were also gained. Our men had formed some acquaintance with the citizens and the country, they had learned the importance of a more thorough discipline and organization, and those who had gone forth as to a picnic or a holiday sat down to count the cost of enduring privations as good soldiers. The nation discovered that this struggle for life was desperate and even dubious, and it was thoroughly aroused. Under the military regime of General Winfield Scott, the cavalry arm of the service had been almost entirely overlooked. His previous campaigns in Mexico, which consisted mainly of the investments of walled cities and of assaults on fortresses, had not been favorable to extensive cavalry operations, and he was not disposed at so advanced an age in life materially to change his tactics of war. What few regiments of cavalry we had in the regular army were mostly broken up into small detachments for the purpose of ranging our western frontiers while a few squads were patrolling between the outposts of our new army, carrying messages from camp to camp, and pompously escorting the commanding generals in their grand reviews and parades. But the Black Horse Cavalry of Virginia at Bull Run, unmatched by any similar force on our side, 
had demonstrated the efficiency and importance of this branch of the service, and our authorities began to change their views. The sentiment of the people at large seemed to turn in the same channel, and a peculiar enthusiasm in this direction was perceptible everywhere. It was as though the spirit of the old knight errantry had suddenly fallen upon us. I was in Troy, New York, when the sad intelligence of the reverse to our arms at Bull Run was received. This was followed quickly by another call for volunteers, and I decided without hesitation to enter the army. In accordance with my resolve, I enlisted as a private soldier at Troy on the 6th day of August, 1861, in a company raced by Captain Clarence Buell for the cavalry service, to encounter the Chivalrous Black Horse Cavalry of Bull Run fame, it was proposed to raise a force in the North, and as Senator Ira Harris of New York was giving this organization his patronage and influence, a brigade was formed, whose banners should bear his name. Originally the regiment to which my company was assigned was intended for the regular army, and was for some time known as the Seventh United States Cavalry but the government having decided to have but six regiments of regular cavalry, and as New York had contributed the majority of the men to the organization, we were denominated the Second Regiment of New York Cavalry, Harris Light. This regiment was organized by J. Mansfield Davies of New York as Colonel, assisted by Judson Kilpatrick of New Jersey as Lieutenant Colonel. The men were mostly from the states of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. On the 13th of August, Captain Buell's Trojan Company was summoned together for the purpose of leaving for the South. Under a severe drenching rain, we were drawn up in line fronting the residence of General John E. Wool when the old veteran delivered a most heroic address, which led us quite to forget the pelting rain and prepared us for our departure. The boys then found a very pleasant shelter on board the Vanderbilt, bound for New York City. The day following all the New York State men rendezvoused at 648 Broadway and were mustered into the service of the United States by Lieutenant Colonel D.B. Sackett of the regular army. At 4 o'clock p.m. we were ordered aboard a train of cars and told that our destination was Camp Howe, near Scarsdale, 24 miles north of the city, between the Harlem and East Rivers. We reached the place just in time to pitch our tents for the night, an operation which was not only new and strange, but performed in anything but a workmanlike manner. We had everything to learn, and this was our first lesson in soldiering. Captain A. N. Duffy, a French officer and graduate of the military school of St. Cyr, is in command of the camp and is to be the superintendent of our discipline and drill. He is somewhat eccentric, but is undoubtedly well qualified for the duties of his position. August 16th. This morning we commenced the inevitable drill on foot as we are still without horses. We find this exercise very severe, and yet in view of its great importance, we accept it with a good degree of relish. Our drill master is thorough and rigidly strict, after the fashion of the French schools. We cannot avoid learning under his tuition. In the afternoon we were set to policing camp. This comprises the cleaning of one of the roughest farms in the country of stone, and as a remuneration to the owners for the use of this most unsightly of God's forsaken ground, we are compelled to build stone fences, a very unpleasant introduction to military life, and an occupation which by no means accords with our ideas of a soldier's duties. But our hands toil with a protest in our hearts, and with a certain resolve that this kind of fencing must not long continue. After a week spent in drill and the Stonewall Enterprise, we were all surprised one morning with an order to fall into line to receive a Napoleonic harangue from Captain Duffy. So many and even loud had been our protests, and so glaringly manifest our rebellious spirit on the subject of fortifying a farm in the state of New York, that the captain undoubtedly feared that he might not be very zealously supported by us in his future movements, and so, like Napoleon, on assuming command of the Army of Italy, he sought to test the devotion of his men. After amusing us a while in his broken English, and arousing us by his touching appeals to our patriotism and honor, at length he shouted, 
Now as many of you as are ready to follow me to the cannon's mouth, take one step to the front. This Dernier resort to pride was perfectly successful, and the whole line took the desired step. We were then ordered to be ready to leave camp at eleven o'clock that morning, which was on the 20th of August, assured that Washington, D.C. was our destination. Our ranks were quickly broken, and all due preparation made for our departure. After marching to Scarsdale, we took cars, and were soon landed in the metropolis, through the principal streets of which our command passed to the Jersey City Ferry. Without much delay, we reached Philadelphia in the evening, where we were bountifully supplied with rations by her proverbially generous and patriotic people. True to the instinct of brotherly love, the citizens are making arrangements such as would indicate that millions of Union soldiers might be fed at their tables. Here we spent the night. The next morning at 6.30 we were on our way southward. A brief halt was made in Baltimore, whose streets still seem to be speaking of the blood of the brave Massachusetts men. And as we march along we can but recall the poet's prophecy. And the eagle never dying still is trying, still is trying, with its wings upon the map to hide a city with its gore. But the name is there forever, and it shall be hidden never, while the awful brand of murder points the avenger to its shore. While the blood of peaceful brothers God's dread vengeance doth implore, thou art doomed, O Baltimore. At four o'clock in the afternoon we beheld the dome of the nation's capital, and, after landing, marched a few hundred yards beyond the eastern boundary of the city, where we pitched tents near Camp Oregon, named thus in honor of Colonel Edward D. Baker, who represented that territory in the United States Senate previous to his acceptance of a military commission, and who is now in command of the famous California Regiment, a noble body of men who will ever follow with devotion the lead of their gallant colonel. Chapter 2. Camp Life and Its Influences. Drill, Drill, and Camp Police are the order of the day. Indeed, we have nothing else to do, and to do nothing at all is the hardest kind of work. We expect soon to have some accoutrements to enable us to drill something besides our feet. Our preparations for war have commenced at the extremities, for thus far nothing but our heads and feet have been instructed. However, as we become better acquainted with this part of our duty, we relish it better than at first, and flatter ourselves that we are making no very mean progress. For some time after our arrival here, the government was unable to supply us with uniforms or weapons of war, and our appearance was far from being a la militaire, as Captain Duffy would have it. Coming as we did from colleges and schools, from offices and counting rooms, from shops and farms, and some from no occupation at all, each with the peculiar dress he wore when he enlisted, and already pretty well worn out by our labors at Camp Howe and extensive traveling, we were a most unsightly, heterogeneous mass of humanity, and were a subject of no little sport to our better-clad fellow soldiers. Especially was this the case when on a certain day General B. F. Butler reviewed the troops of this department, and we were made to appear before him and the multitude with our hats and caps, our coats and jackets, in nearly all colors, and many of them in rags and shags. We certainly had nothing to recommend us to the consideration of military men, except the courageous spirit that throbbed in our generally robust frames. But we were hopeful of better days when we might have the appearance and equipage, as well as the internal qualities of soldiers. But the government was so wholly unprepared for war that our supplies were received very slowly. First came our uniforms, which every man donned gladly, and yet with a feeling that the last link to civil life, for the present, was severed, and that henceforth in a very peculiar sense we belonged to our common country. A few days after our arrival at Camp Oregon, we were joined by the men who belonged to our regiment from other states. This added fresh enthusiasm, as well as new strength, to our ranks. However, there is as yet nothing in our toot ensemble to distinguish us from infantry or artillery, except the yellow trimming of our blue uniforms, whereas the infantry has the light blue trimming and the artillery bright red. August 23rd. Today I am happy to make the following entry in my diary, namely, 
the regiment was furnished with sabers, Colt's revolvers, and all the necessary appendages, consisting of belts and ammunition boxes. Every man has now a new care and pride, to keep his saber bright and his entire outfit clean, that he may wear them with pleasure to himself and honor to his comrades. The morning and evening of the 24th were spent in saber exercise, with which we were all delighted. This is the first development in us of the cavalry element as such, and we begin to feel our individuality. We desire to have this growth continue uninterruptedly, and in aid of it, in the early part of September, came quite a large installment of horses and equipments. This occurred while the regiment occupied a camp about three miles from Washington, on the Bladensburg Road, which we named Sussex, in honor of Sussex County, New York, our colonel's native county. As the number of horses furnished us at this time was not sufficient to mount the whole command, the number received by each company was proportioned to the maximum roll of its men. After the non-commissioned officers of each company, including all the sergeants and corporals, had drawn their horses according to rank, the privates were made to draw lots for the remainder, a performance which produced no little amount of excitement. Several of our comrades were of course unfortunately compelled for several days to march on foot, though much against their wishes, for nothing could be more humiliating to a dragoon than to be trudging through the mud and dust, while his companions are gliding past him with their naking steeds, on their way to the drill ground or to any other post of duty. It was my good fortune to be the recipient of a beautiful black mare, only five years old, full of life and fiery metal fourteen hands high and weighing not less than ten hundred pounds. She was a gem for the cavalry service or anything else, and a friendship was destined to grow up between us, worthy of future mention. We are now fairly out upon the ocean of our new life and are beginning to feel its influence. It does not take the careful observer long to notice the effects which outward changes and circumstances have upon the characters of most men. Indeed, no man remains unaffected by them he either advances or retrogrades. And it is very apparent already among us that while soldiering does make some men, it unmakes many. The very lowest stratum of life among us, such as represents the loungers in the streets and lanes of our cities, those who have neither occupation nor culture, is amazingly influenced for the better by military discipline. These men now find themselves with something to do, and with somebody to make them do it, the progress is very slow, it is true, and in some cases exceptional, but this is evidently the general tendency. On the other hand, however, our regiment is made up principally of young men from highly respectable families, reared under the influences of a pure morality, who find that the highest standard of morality presented here is much lower than they were wont to have at home, and they soon begin to waver. Thus, Having lost their first moorings of character, they start downward, and in many instances are precipitated to horrible depths. When once a shaking monarchy declines, each thing grows bold and to its fall combines. Only a very few have sufficient force in themselves to effectually resist these evils. It must be remembered that the wholesome and normal restraints of virtuous female society are wholly removed from us and from what we daily see around us we are convinced that a colony of men only, however virtuous or moral, would in a short time run into utter barbarism. No candid observer can doubt the teaching of the old scripture that it is not good for man to be alone. Moreover, the friends and associates of our childhood's innocence, whose presence always calls forth the purest memories, are not with us nor do we feel the almost omnipotent influences of the old schoolhouse gatherings, of the church-going bell, and of the home fireside. When you sever all these ties and helps to a moral life, and throw a man in the immediate association of the vicious, he must be only a little less than an angel not to fall. Here we are all dressed alike, live alike, and are all subject to like laws and discipline. The very man who shares our blanket and tent cover who draws rations from the same kettle, who drinks from the same canteen, and with whom we are compelled to come in contact daily, may be the veriest poltroon, 
whose diploma shows graduation at the five points, and whose presence alone is morally miasmatic. Consequently, our camp is infested more or less with gambling, drunkenness, and profanity, and all their train of attendant evils, and at times we long for campaigning in the field, where it seems to us we may rid ourselves of this demoralization. Hannibal's toilsome marches across the Alps and through Upper Italy only gave hardihood and courage to his legions, who came thundering at the very gates of Rome and threatening its immediate overthrow. But a winter's camp life at Capua left them shorn of their strength. But then we have remedial influences even in camp, and we hail them with no little delight. Daily the newsboys make their appearance, calling out, Washington Chronicle and New York Papers. They enjoy an extensive patronage. With these sheets, many moments are pleasantly spent as their columns are eagerly perused. Then, following hard on the track of the newsboys, comes our adjutant's orderly, or courier, with a mailbag full of letters, precious mementos from the loved ones at home. These messages are the best reminders we have of our home life, especially when they are brimful, as is usually the case, with patriotic sparkling and with affection's purest libations. These letters have a double influence. While they keep the memories of home more or less bright within us, and at times so bright that as we read we can almost see our mothers, wives, and sisters in their tender Christian solicitude for us, they also stimulate us to greater improvements in the epistolary art. Men who never wrote a letter in their lives before are at it now. Those who cannot write at all are either learning or engage their comrades to write for them. And the command is doing more writing in one day than, I should judge, we used to do in a month, and perhaps a year. No sooner are the contents of the mailbag distributed and devoured by the eager newsmongers than active preparations are made for responding. Some men carry pocket inkstands and write with pens, but the majority use pencils. Here you see one seated on a stump or fence, addressing his sweetheart, wife, or mother. Another writes standing up against a tree, while a third is lying flat on the ground. Thus, either in the tents or in the open air, scribbling is going on, and the return mail will carry many sweet words to those who cannot be wholly forgotten. I suppose in this way we are not only making, but writing history. Camp life, then, is not entirely monotonous. Sights and sounds of interest may be seen and heard at almost every hour of the day. The morning is ushered in with the shrill reveille, which means awake and arise. This is well executed by our bugle corps, which Colonel Davies has organized, and is drilling thoroughly. All our movements are now ordered by the bugle. By its blast we are called to our breakfast, dinner, and supper. Roll call is sounded twice a day and the companies fall into line when the first sergeants easily ascertain whether every man is at his post of duty. The bugle calls the sick, and sometimes those who feign to be to the surgeon's quarters, and their wants and woes are attended to. By the bugle, we are summoned to inspections, to camp guard, to the feeding and watering of our horses, and to drill. A peculiarly shrill call is that which brings all the first or orderly sergeants to the adjutant's quarters to receive any special order he may have to communicate. Thus, call after call is sounded at intervals throughout the day, ending with taps, which is the signal for blowing out the lights and seeking the rest which night demands. Any neglect of the latter call usually brings the offender to the guardhouse or sends him to extra duty. Our principal duties now are camp guard and drill, which we perform by turns. Every morning quite a large force is detailed, with a commissioned officer in command, for guard duty. These form a line of dismounted pickets, or veditus, around the entire camp. They are stationed within sight and hailing distance of each other, enabling them to prevent anyone from leaving or entering camp without a written pass in the daytime or the countersign at night. The rule is to have each man stand post for two hours when he is relieved. This is the maximum time, and is sometimes made less at the discretion of the commandant. We are told, as we perform this duty, that it is not very unlike the picketing that will be required of us 
if we are ever permitted to take the field which confronts the enemy. Indeed, this is picketing on a small scale, and our enthusiasm in this branch of our work increases as we are almost daily in receipt of accounts of attacks on our pickets along the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the Cumberland Canal. It appears that a certain Colonel Turner Ashby, with a force of cavaliers, acting as guerrillas, singly and in squads, is nightly endeavoring to sever our telegraph wires, to burn our railroad bridges, and to destroy the canal, or fire at our men on the passing boats. And not infrequently we read of skirmishes in which several of our pickets have been either captured, wounded, or killed. We, of course, expect before long to face Colonel Ashby and his Confederates, and are preparing ourselves for the issue. The regiment was supplied with its full complement of horses a few days since, and mounted drill is now the general order of the day. Nearly all our time not otherwise occupied is now devoted to this exercise. At first we had some exciting times with our young and untrained horses. One of our men received a kick from his horse which proved fatal to his life. Several of our wildest and seemingly incorrigible ones we have been compelled to run up the steepest hills in the vicinity, under the wholesome discipline of sharp spurs, until the evil has been sweated out of them. We find, however, that the trouble is not only with the horses but frequently with the men, many of whom have never bridled a horse nor touched a saddle. And then, too, these curbed bits in the mouths of animals that had been trained with the common bridle produced a most rebellious temper, causing many of them to pitch up into the air as though they had suddenly been transformed into monstrous kangaroos, while the riders showed signs of having taken lessons in somersaults. Some of the scenes are more than ludicrous. Horses and men are acting very awkwardly, also, with the guiding of the animal by the rein against the neck, and not by the bit, as we were accustomed to do at home. We do not wonder much that the chivalrous black horse gentry have expressed their contempt of northern mud sills and greasy mechanics, and have made their brags that we could never match them. But then it is said that these Southrons were born in a saddle, and were always trained in horsemanship. They generally perform their pleasure excursions, go on their business journeys, and even to church on horseback. They were therefore prepared for the cavalry service, before we had so much as thought of it. But let them beware of what they think or say, for we can learn. And it does frequently occur that somewhere in the experience of contending parties, the first is last and the last first. We are improving rapidly. There is so much exhilaration in the shrill bugle notes which order the movements of the drill, and so much life in its swift evolutions, that the men and horses seem to dance rather than walk on their way to the drill grounds, and both are readily learning the certain sounds of the trumpet, and becoming masters of motions and dispositions required of them. Like all other apprentices, of course, we occasionally indulge in the reveries of imagination, and think we are laying the foundation of a career which is destined to be important and glorious. Be this as it may, we do not mean to be outstripped by the most efficient in our knowledge and practice of cavalry tactics and of the general maneuverings of war. Chapter 3 Preparations for Active Service October 15, 1861 The Harris Light broke camp at 8 o'clock a.m. and marched proudly through Washington, crossed the famous Long Bridge over the Potomac, and moved forward to Munson's Hill in full view of our infantry outposts, where we established a new camp, calling it Advance. For the first time our horses remained saddled through the night, and the men slept on their arms. To us this was a new and exciting phase of life. Since our retreat from Bull Run, the rebel army has made itself formidable on this line, and though no active movements have been attempted on Washington, we are nevertheless apprehensive of such a measure on their part. Hence our picket lines are doubly strong and vigilant, while every means is resorted to, to ascertain the position, strength, and intention of our wily foe. Frequently, contrabands feel their way through the enemy's pickets under cover of the night, and through the tangled brushwood which abounds, and reach our lines safely. From them we gain much valuable information of the state of things in Dixie. 
Some of them, we learn, were employed by rebel leaders in constructing forts and earthworks, and in various ways were made to contribute muscle to the Southern Confederacy. They have strange and exciting stories to tell us, and yet it seems as though they might be of great service to us if we saw fit to employ them as guides in our movements. Their hearts are with us in this conflict. They hail us as friends and entertain wild notions about a jubilee of liberty, for which they are ever praying and singing and look upon us as their deliverers. How they have formed such opinions is somewhat difficult to conjecture, especially when we consider the anomalous treatment they have received from our hands. The authorities have seemed to be puzzled with regard to them, and there are cases where they have even been returned to their former owners, and yet there seems to be an instinctive prophecy in their natures, which leads them to look to Northmen for freedom. Their presence in our camps becomes a sort of inspiration to most of us, and we earnestly hope that their prayers may be answered and that every chain of servitude may be broken. This sentiment at times breaks out in such as the following poetic strain. In the beauty of the lily Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make them free. And as slavery was the cause, and not, as some say, the pretext of the war, if the Union arms succeed, this irrepressible conflict and villainous wrong must come to an end. Our confidence in the ultimate success of our arms is daily increasing. Since the first of August our ranks have been wonderfully swelled, and now regiment after regiment, battery after battery, is pouring in from the north, filling the camps of instruction and manning the fortifications around Washington. Meanwhile, earthworks are being constructed on all the high hills and commanding positions, strong abatis are made of the forest trees, and everything done that can give the city an air of security and the country round about the appearance of a bristling porcupine. Should this influx of troops continue, we shall be compelled to advance our lines for very room on which to station them. We have some intimations that our advance to this point today is preparatory to such a movement. The day following our advance to Munson's Hill, I was promoted to the rank of corporal on recommendation of Captain Buell, my appointment to date from the 15th. On the 16th, our lines were advanced to Vienna, a station on the Leesburg Railroad, and on the 17th as far as Fairfax Courthouse, the Confederate force falling back towards Centerville and Manassas Junction without offering us the slightest opportunity to bring them into an engagement. We are spending our time mostly in foraging, scouting, and patrolling. In consequence of imperfect transportation, the cavalry especially is compelled to seek its own forage, with which, however, the country abounds. Corn is found in right smart heaps, as the natives say, either in the fields or barns, and hayricks dot the country on every side. But there is a certain degree of scrupulousness on the part of some of our commanders with regard to appropriating the produce of the sacred soil to our own use, which greatly embarrasses our foraging expeditions and exasperates not a little those of us who are needy of the things we are at times ordered not to take. It is no uncommon thing to find one of our men stationed as safeguard over the property of a most bitter rebel, property which, in our judgment, ought to be confiscated to the use of the Union or utterly destroyed. We do not believe in handling rebels with kid gloves, and especially when we know that the very men whom we protect are constantly giving information to the enemy of all our movements and using their property whenever they can to aid and comfort the cause of treason. We are too forcibly reminded of the fable we used to read in our schoolboy days of the farmer and the viper. We are only warming into new life and strength this virus of rebellion to have it recoil upon ourselves. We hope our authorities will soon discover their error and change their tactics. Our scouting is on a limited scale, though it affords considerable exercise and excitement. Thereby we are learning the topography of the country and making small maps of the same. We are traversing the forests through the wood roads and by-paths which run in every direction, strolling by the streams and ravines, and gaining all the information which can be of use to us in future maneuvers. We scout in small squads over the entire area occupied by our forces, and often beyond, 
and now and then, more frequently in the night, we patrol between our picket posts to ascertain that all is well at the points most exposed to danger. The principal object of scouting is to learn the strength and position of the enemy, while the object of patrolling is to learn our own. October 20th. Today the regiment was honored by a visit from its patron, Senator Ira Harris. After witnessing a mounted drill and parade, which pleased him much, he presented us a beautiful stand of colors, accompanied by an appropriate and eloquent address. He made a special reference to the object of the organization, the hopes of its friends, and their earnest prayers for its future usefulness and success. He dwelt enthusiastically upon the work before us. At the close of the speech, the command responded with a rousing round of cheers, expressive of their thankfulness for the banner and of their determination to keep it, to stand by it, and to defend it even with their lives. The occasion was one to be remembered. Another great pall of sadness has fallen upon our soldiers. The papers bring intelligence of our terrible disaster at Ball's Bluff, and the promising Colonel E. D. Baker has fallen, while gallantly leading his noble Californians. Discussions as to the cause or causes of that fatal advance and retreat are now in vogue throughout our camps. It does seem to many as though gross incompetence or treachery must have influenced the authorities having immediate oversight of the affair, and that our fallen braves have been needlessly immolated upon their country's altar. Big Bethel, Bull Run and Ball's Bluff, oh, alliteration of blunders, of blunders more than enough, in a time full of blunders and wonders. But the boys are enthusiastic over the bravery of our 1900, who fought against a force more than twice their number, with all the advantage of position and knowledge of the country. All our battles have proven that our men can fight, and, though providence seems to have been against us thus far, for reasons most inscrutable, we will not waver in our determination to dare or die in the contest. Our chief difficulties are not in the rank and file of the army, but in the general management of the forces, and we trust that our long right men will be found to take the places of incompetent ones. Being detailed by Colonel Davies for recruiting service, I left camp on the 28th of October and proceeded in company with Lieutenant Charles E. Morton to New York. We went on to Newburgh, near the lieutenant's native home, where we remained a few days together. But on the 1st of November, I was ordered to Troy to act independently. I spent several weeks in this peculiar work, and with good success. Though recruiting offices could be found on all the principal streets of our cities and villages, yet a good business was done by them all, such was the enthusiasm which prevailed among the people. War meetings were frequently held and addressed by our best orators. The press, with few exceptions, poured forth its eloquent appeals to the strong-bodied men of the country to range themselves on the side of right against wrong. Violence would be done to truth did we not mention also that the pulpits of the land were potent helpers in this work, by their religious patriotism and persistent efforts to keep the great issue distinctly before the people. Thus the mind and heart of the North were kept alive to the great problem of the nation's existence, and men were rallying to our standard. It was no uncommon thing to receive applications to enter our lists from young men or boys too young and slender to be admitted, who left our offices in tears of disappointment unless we could find for them a position as drummers and buglers. A single instance of enlistment under my observation might be mentioned, as it gives a specimen of the manner in which our work went on. Having taken passage on the ears one day from one point of my labors to another, I fell in with a young man who was on his way to college, where he expected to be matriculated the following day. His valise was full of books and other students' requisites, and his heart full of literary ambition. Attracted to me by my uniform, he soon learned my business, and, after a few moments of pensiveness, to my surprise, he told me to inscribe his name among my recruits. Then turning to a friend on board the car, he said, Take this trunk to my home, and tell mother I have enlisted in a cavalry regiment. On the 4th of December I returned from recruiting service, bringing with me all recruits who had not been previously sent to the regiment. I found the Harris Light occupying Camp Palmer on Arlington Heights.
the confiscated property of the rebel general Robert E. Lee. On arriving in camp, I found that the papers from Washington contained a letter of Secretary Seward directing General McClellan not to return to their former owner's contrabands in our lines. This order, when fully understood by our colored friends, will undoubtedly increase their exit from Egypt, as many of them style their escape from bondage. The government will probably adopt measures to give these fugitives systematic assistance and labor, that they may be of use to us. Already I find that a large number of our officers have adopted them for cooks and hostlers, in which positions they certainly excel, and there is no good reason why we may not employ them as teamsters on our trains and helpers in our trenches. They are generally very powerful and show signs of great endurance. Nor do we find them unwilling to labor as we have been so often told they were. However, we do not wonder much that they have acquired the reputation of being lazy, for what but a thing or an animal could take pleasure in unrequited toil? Now they have a personal interest and take a peculiar delight in what they do for us. Their great willingness and ability to work for Uncle Sam or any of his boys would indicate that they will become eminently useful in the service of their country. From Camp Palmer, the regiment had gone out to drill for some time, and here we continued through the month, generally occupying the large plain which lies between the Arlington House and the Potomac, and in full view of Washington. On this field, Kilpatrick, Davies, Duffel, and others began to develop their soldierly qualities, infusing them into their commands, and imparting that knowledge of cavalry tactics which would prepare us for the duties of war. We have recently been greatly encouraged by the movements of Colonel George Dashiel Bayard of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry, who, on the 27th of November, while on a scout on the road to Leesburg, Loudoun County, met a band of the chivalry near Drainsville, with whom he had a spirited skirmish. The whole affair would indicate that Colonel Bayard is destined to be no mean cavalry leader. Cavalry regiments from most of the loyal states have been organized and are now in camps of instruction. Occasionally they go out scouting, picketing, etc., and are thus preparing for the coming campaigns. December 14th. Today a brigade of Pennsylvanians, including two squadrons of Colonel Bayard's cavalry regiment, the whole force under the command of General E.O.C. Ord, while foraging in the vicinity of Drainsville, were attacked by a rebel force nearly equal in numbers, with General J.E.B. Stewart commanding in person. A lively contest followed, in which the rebels were thoroughly beaten and driven from the field, losing, according to their own accounts, about 250 in killed, wounded, and captured. They left 25 dead horses on the field, with the debris of two caissons, disabled and exploded by the well-directed fire of Easton's battery, which accompanied the expedition. The rebels, who had undoubtedly come out for the purpose of forage as well as ourselves, having a long wagon train, retreated toward Fairfax Courthouse, with their wagons laden with their wounded. Our loss includes only nine killed and sixty wounded. Unimportant as this victory might seem, it caused an immense rejoicing in the Union ranks. It was a fitting answer to the calumny heaped upon us from both north and south, that our soldiers could not fight, and were no match for their boastful enemy. Chapter 4 The Advance to the Rappahannock The winter was one of preparation, not of operation. Why we were kept all quiet along the Potomac until the announcement, reiterated through the press, elicited only disdainful merriment among our friends, was never satisfactorily explained. The month of December had been beautiful, the roads in excellent condition, the army well supplied and disciplined, so that nothing but hesitancy in our leaders stood in the way of army movements. The North and West, which had supplied myriads of men and millions of money, were becoming very impatient with such a state of things. This feeling was intensified by the fact that it was known that the enemy was tireless in his efforts to increase his army and to fortify his strongholds, while he was also gaining the sympathy of foreign powers and, by means of blockade running, was adding not a little to his munitions of war. The army shared largely in this general discontent. Why do we not advance? 
was everywhere the interrogation of eager officers and men. However, we were not wholly unemployed, for while we waited for reinforcements and cannon, as demanded by the general in command, and for the leaves to fall from the trees to facilitate movements in a country so thickly wooded as is Virginia, we were kept busy with the camp curriculum, namely the drill, the guard, the inspection, and parade. General Lee's plantation on Arlington Heights and the surrounding country were thoroughly trodden by loyal feet as men and horses were acquiring the form and power of military life. But our quiet was to be broken by our grand advance, which commenced on the 3rd of March. The Harris Light broke camp at three o'clock in the morning, and with several regiments of cavalry, under the command of Colonel W. W. Averill, led the advance the Harris Light having the position of honor as vanguard. We were ordered to move slowly and cautiously, which we did on the main thoroughfare known as the Little River Turnpike, and at four o'clock p.m. we arrived at Fairfax Courthouse, having marched only about fourteen miles. What was our surprise to find the place entirely deserted by the enemy, who had left the day previous, with the design of retiring beyond the Rappahannock. This change of affairs seemed so sudden as to be full of mystery, and was wholly unknown even to our secret corpse. We could not doubt but that this movement was performed in anticipation of some of our contemplated maneuvers, of which the rebel leaders are generally informed by their spies in Washington and all through our lines, even before they are known to our army. Our march was resumed the following day at ten o'clock a.m., and early in the afternoon we captured the Quaker guns at Centerville. The enemy had actually placed in the earthworks or forts which commanded the road large trunks of trees resembling cannon of heavy caliber which frowned down upon us from the heights. Had it not been for the information we had received from contrabands on the march that the enemy had evacuated, a report confirmed by the curling smoke which rose from various parts of the field, this formidable array of threatening cannon would have greatly retarded our progress. Indeed, it was not until after the suspicious works had been thoroughly scanned with field glasses that we were ordered to advance, when the strong position was carried without the snapping of a cap or a saber stroke. Chagrin was written upon every face. Not a sign of the enemy was visible, save the deserted remains of their winter quarters, which fell into our hands. A very brief halt was here made, and hurrying our steps we soon crossed the memorable Bull Run and came up with the rear guard of the retiring army at Manassas Junction. Here we pitched into them and kicked up a little dust on the road to Bristow. This expedition, or wild goose chase, was continued to Warrenton Junction, where General George D. Stoneman found the enemy in force, but returned without attacking them. Having loitered about these historic fields a few days, our whole force began to fall back towards its old position on the Potomac, establishing our advanced picket lines, however, as far forward as Centerville, with Fairfax Courthouse as headquarters. Our line of pickets intercepts the Leesburg Turnpike at Drainsville and extends to the Potomac, a distance of about twenty miles. As guerrillas and their brethren, the bushwhackers, infest the country more or less, picketing is dangerous as well as difficult. Between the Rappahannock and the Potomac lies a vast territory which abounds in creeks, marshes, deep dark forests, with only here and there a village or settlement. A little to the west of this plain extend the Bull Run Mountains, with their ravines and caverns. This is a very fit hiding place for mischief-makers. The guerrillas consist mostly of farmers and mechanics, residents of this region, who, by some means, are exempt from the rebel conscription. Most of them follow their usual avocations during the day and have their rendezvous at night, where they congregate to lay their plans of attack on the pickets. They resort to every stratagem which a vile and savage spirit could inspire. Sometimes a picket is approached by the stealthiest creeping through the dark thickets when the unfortunate sentinel is seized and quickly dispatched by a bowie knife or other like weapon, which a Sothron can always use most dexterously. When mere stealth cannot accomplish the task, other methods are used. For instance, on a dark night, a vedette stationed by a thick underbrush heard a cowbell approaching him, and supposing that the accompanying rustle of leaves and crackling of dry limbs was occasioned by a bovine friend, 
unwittingly suffered himself to be captured by a bushwhacker. But the boys soon learned to be suspicious of every noise they heard, so much so that one night a picket, hearing footsteps approaching him, cried out, Halt! Who comes there? His carbine was instantly brought to a ready, and as no halt occurred nor answer was made, a second challenge was given. But failing to effect anything, he fired in the direction of the noise when he distinctly heard a heavy fall and then groans, as of somebody dying. The sergeant of the post, running up to ascertain the cause of the alarm, found that an unfortunate ox that had been grazing his way through the forest lay dying, with his forehead perforated by the faithful sentry's bullet. The incident caused considerable merriment and the pickets were supplied with poor Confederate beef during the remainder of their term of duty. But the attacks are frequently of a more disastrous character, resulting in the killing of men and horses in wounds and in captures. The utmost care and strictest vigilance cannot secure us perfectly from depredations. Our general plan is as follows. The major part of the regiment or picket detail establishes what we denominate the main reserve within a mile or two in rear of the center of the line of vedettes or at a point where their assistance, in case of an attack, can be secured at any place in the line at the shortest possible notice. About midway between the main reserve and the picket line are stationed two, three, or four picket reliefs, so situated as to form, with the line of vedettes for a base, a pyramid, with its apex at the main reserve. The boys will not soon forget the long, dreary, dangerous hours they spent along this line. Here we find ourselves shivering around a miserable fire among the sighing pines, though in times of special danger we are not permitted to have even this slight comfort for fear of detection, often compelled to sit or lie down in snow or mud, or to walk about smartly to prevent freezing to death. Sometimes, when much exhausted, we have laid ourselves down on the damp and muddy ground, which was frozen stiffly and held us as a vice when we awoke. Frozen fingers and toes were no uncommon occurrence. In this wretched plight we hear the summons to get ready to stand post. We go out upon our shivering horses to sit in the saddle for two hours or more, facing the biting wind and peering through the storm of sleet, snow, or rain, which unmercifully pelts us in its fury. But it were well for us if this was our worst enemy, and we consider ourselves happy if the gorilla does not creep through bushes impenetrable to the sight to inflict his mortal blows. The two hours expire relief comes, and the vedette returns to spend his four, six, or eight hours off post as best he may. Once, at least, during the night, we are visited by the Grand Guard, which consists of the officer of the day, accompanied by others, whose duty it is to make a thorough, though usually swift, inspection of the picket line. Most of our time is spent in this duty. March 29th Considerable excitement prevailed among us today as Colonel Bayard was dispatched with a detachment of his regiment to repulse a dastardly raid made by some of General J. E. B. Stewart's men on the house of a Mrs. Tennant, a Union lady residing near Difficult Run, about six miles from Chain Bridge. Colonel Bayard reached the place a few moments too late, and the raiders succeeded in taking Mrs. Tennant as a prisoner and making off with their prey. For several weeks the main portion of our Grand Army has been sent by transports to the peninsula, with the evident intention of moving upon Richmond by shorter land routes than by way of Manassas. This change in our plan of attack was probably known by the rebels before they were matured at Washington, and we now understand why they so quietly evacuated their positions on our front. General McDowell remains in command of the defenses of Washington, with a force sufficient, it is believed, to give safety to the capital, and to harass the rebels who continue before us. With the departure of General McClellan to the peninsula, our picket lines were immediately withdrawn to Annandale and Falls Church, within a few miles of the fortifications surrounding Washington. April 4th The Harris Light and the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry were recalled from the picket lines and sent out on a reconnaissance in force, with a division in command of General McDowell. 
our march led us through Fairfax Courthouse and Santerville, near which we bivouacked for the night. Already at this early springtime, a luxurious vegetable growth of green is beautifully carpeting the fields through which we pass and in which we halt. Flowers of great beauty and variety of hues and sweetness of perfume greet us on every hand. It would seem as though nature were struggling to hide the desolations which war has made and were weaving her chaplets of honor around the graves of our fallen brothers. And it really seems as though destruction himself had contributed to this lavish growth. Thus, life evermore is fed by death, in earth or sea or sky, and that a rose may breathe its breath, something must die. On the fifth we continued on our march to Bristow Station, on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, where we encountered one of the most furious snowstorms ever known in this region of country. The wind which bore the snow was cold and cutting. It was a season never to be forgotten by those who were quartered in mere shelter tents or had no tents at all. So sudden are the changes of the atmosphere here that no man knoweth what a moment may bring forth. Yesterday we sought shelter from the sun's heat under the budding trees, while grass and flowers and singing birds indicated settled weather. Today the storm howls music through the bending pines, and snow several inches deep covers the earth. We are thoroughly convinced that the character of the people here greatly partakes of the nature of these surroundings. Is not this the case everywhere? But we see it here more plainly than we ever did before. The people are fitful and their spasms are terrible, and yet we find them at times to be as kind and hospitable as any we have ever found elsewhere. After one has witnessed their beautiful days, cooled with a gentle sea breeze, which generally blows from about nine o'clock in the morning till six at night, and then their cool, calm evenings, he can see why there are so many lovely traits in the nature of the people. But if he experience some of their sudden and terrific snowstorms and showers, when the thunder and the lightning are such that a northerner feels that all the storms he has ever witnessed are only infantile attempts, he is inclined to extenuate on mere climactic principles the outbursts of wrath and fire-eating propensities of the people. He who is gendered of fire and brimstone must have some vim in his composition. We believe this study is not unworthy the Christian philosopher and philanthropist. The day following the storm, the sun came out warmly, and the snow suddenly disappeared, but left us in a bed of mud. The soil, naturally rich and tender, consisting of a reddish loam, trodden by many feet and cut by the wheels of heavy vehicles, became almost impassable, but it has this advantage that it soon dries, so the soil, as well as the atmosphere and the people, is suddenly changeable. April 5th Today our expedition continued its march to Catlett's Station, a few miles south of Bristow. General Augur commands the advance, which consists of a brigade of infantry and two regiments of cavalry. On the 8th of the month a detachment of the Harris Light was ordered out on picket at 6 o'clock p.m., and we enjoyed a quiet, pleasant trip on this usually unpleasant duty. Here we spent a few days picketing, scouting and patrolling, and on the 17th we advanced from Catlett's in the direction of Falmouth, on the Rappahannock. Our march was rapid and lay through a country altogether new to us, which, however, presented no very interesting features. The Harris Light had the advance and was followed by the 14th Brooklyn. As our infantry comrades became footsore and weary, we exchanged positions with them for mutual relief, until at last one half of the regiments were bearing one another's burdens. This incident paved the way for a strong friendship to grow up between us, Seventeen miles were traveled quietly, when a sudden fire on our advance guard brought every cavalryman to his horse and infantryman to his musket. Everything assumed the signs of a fight. Kilpatrick, who was in command of the regiment, ordered his band to the rear. This precaution of the commander was no sooner taken than the vanguard, in command of Lieutenant George Decker, was making a furious charge upon Field's cavalry, which was doing outpost duty ten miles from Falmouth. On the very first assault, Lieutenant Decker fell from his horse, 
pierced through the heart with a fatal bullet. He was a daring young man, well-formed, light complexion, blue eyes, and about twenty-three years of age. He was much lamented by his many friends. His fall, shocking as it was to the command, being our first fatal casualty, only seemed to nerve the men for bold revenge. And we had it. Like chaff before the whirlwind, the outpost was quickly scattered, and the whole regiment entered upon its first charge with a will, a charge which continued for several miles with wild excitement. Picket reliefs and reserves were swept away like forest trees before the avalanche, and we fell upon their encampment before time had been afforded them for escape. Here we captured several men and horses with large quantities of stores, and then rested our tired steeds and fed them with Confederate forage. The men enjoyed the captured rations. It was nearly night, and as the sun disappeared, the infantry force came up to our newly possessed territory. The cavalry was ordered to stand to horse, and a strong picket was thrown out to prevent any surprise attack or flanking movement of the enemy. In the early part of the evening, one of our pickets was surprised by the friendly approach of a citizen of Falmouth, who had come, as he said, to hail once more the old star-spangled banner and to greet his loyal brethren of the North. Such a patriotic and fearless individual among the white population of that section of country was a great rarity, and his protestations of friendship were at first received with some suspicion. He was, however, brought to General Augur's headquarters, where he gave satisfactory proof of his kind intentions, and then gave the general a full description of the position and strength of the enemy. A plan for a night attack was thereupon laid and committed to Bayark and Kilpatrick. Our instructions were conveyed to use in a whisper. A beautiful moonlight fell upon the scene, which was as still as death, and with a proud determination, the two young cavalry chieftains moved forward to the night's fray. Bayard was to attack on the main road in front, but not until Kilpatrick had commenced operations on their right flank by a detour through a neglected and narrow wood path. As the heights were considered well nigh impregnable, it was necessary to resort to some stratagem for which Kilpatrick showed a becoming aptness. Having approached to within hearing distance of the rebel pickets, but before we were challenged, Kilpatrick shouted with his clear voice which sounded like a trumpet on the still night air, Bring up your artillery in the center and infantry on the left. Well, but, Colonel, replied an honest, though rather obtuse captain, we haven't got any inf- Silence in the ranks, commanded the leader. Artillery in the center, infantry on the left. The pickets caught and spread the alarm, and thus greatly facilitated our hazardous enterprise. Charge! was the order which then thrilled the ranks and echoed through the dark, dismal woods, and the column swept up the rugged heights in the midst of blazing cannon and rattling musketry. So steep was the ascent that not a few saddles slipped off the horses, precipitating their riders into a creek which flowed lazily at the base of the hill, while others fell dead and dying, struck by the missiles of destruction, which at times filled the air. But the red field was won, and the enemy, driven at the point of the saber, fled unceremoniously down the heights, through Falmouth, and over the bridge which spanned the Rappahannock, burning the beautiful structure behind them to prevent pursuit. Quite a number of prisoners and various materials of war fell into our hands. Kilpatrick and Bayard were both highly complimented for their personal bravery on this occasion. April 18th this morning at eight o'clock, General Augur took peaceful possession of Falmouth, and here, with military honors, the remains of Lieutenant Decker and about fifteen others, who fell in the late struggle, were interred. Later in the day, and after considerable hesitation, the mayor of Fredericksburg formally surrendered the city to the Yankee general, whose guns on Falmouth Heights commanded obedience. A bridge of canal boats, similar to a pontoon, was constructed across the river, and we took possession of this beautiful, proud city. This was the first appearance of Yankees in this rebel locality, and we were the subject of no little curiosity. Many of the people who, by the misrepresentations of their licentious press and flaming orators, 
had been led to believe that Yankees were a species of one-eyed cyclops, or long-clawed harpies, or horned and hoofed devils, who had been deceived into the notion that President Lincoln was a deformed mulatto, degenerated into a hideous monkey, and that all his followers were of that sort, on seeing us, expressed great surprise and wished to know if we were specimens of the Lincoln army. They had forgotten that our fathers fought side by side in our common country's early struggles, and that now we, their children as brothers, ought all to sit unitedly under the tree of liberty which they had planted and nourished with their heart's blood.